Hello and welcome. I am Beth Maszewski, Assistant Research Scientist for Hazardous Waste and Pollutants at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves in our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Muscutin, Adawa, Sac, Muskaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all our differences with the native peoples at the core of our efforts. This webinar and all of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars are certified green events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment. To find out more about certified green events through U of I, please visit sustainability.illinois.edu. Find out more about the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars, or to sign up for the events email list, please visit istc.illinois.edu slash events. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing online in about a week. I'll be um, sending an email out to everyone who registered for the webinar once those are available. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type in questions at any time through the Zoom Q&A feature. You will be able to upvote questions through Zoom Q&A. The most popular questions will be asked first, followed by the questions in the order that they were received. If you have technical difficulties, please send me a private chat message. With that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Kayla Cook. Kayla is a principal engineer and contaminant expert with Hazen Sawyer, a water engineering firm with offices across the US, in Central and South America, and in the Middle East. She has over seven years of experience studying the intersection of polymer science and water resources. Kayla has consulted on water quality, process design, process analysis, and operations manuals for both water and wastewater treatment facilities. So Kayla, thank you for joining us and the webinar is yours. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so I take it that if you are attending today that you also care a great deal about sustainability and plastic waste. Um, so I'm going to kind of back it up a little bit. We'll talk about plastics from a bigger picture perspective and why we're even concerned about the smallest of those particles that occur in our environment. Um, perhaps you've already covered some of this. Um, but microplastics are in fact the plastic particles that occur between the size range of one nanometer and one and five millimeters, according to the regulatory definition. I typically like to go with the regulatory definition uh, when discussing microplastics because nanoplastics as a subset there are in fact potentially more toxic than microplastics themselves. Um, the only reason that we discuss microplastics and plastic waste in general from the uh, perspective of the size range in which it occurs is because microplastics are more likely to be transported in the environment and occur within the human body. For example, microplastics have been found in uh, placenta and human blood. So it is this uh, perspective of occurrence, fate, and transport on microplastics that leads us to want to study them more um, and also leading toward their regulation in the drinking water and wastewater field, which I'll dive into a bit more here in a second. Because of the, the small size range in which these particles occur, they can move much more freely around in the environment. This includes the infiltration into our groundwater, which has been proven in literature, um, and the, uh, the occurrence of precipitation, for example, which is very concerning. Kind of zooming in here to um, what a microplastic is a bit more, adding additional degrees of complexity, we see that it is not simply the size range, but it also must be composed of greater than 1% polymeric material. 
Um, this is particularly interesting whenever we consider that there are synthetic textile blends that perhaps maybe only have 1% polyester. Regardless of the predominant <clears throat> material type there, these are these fibers that these materials shed are in fact considered microplastics, which also touches on another interesting um, parameter of microplastics, that these occur in various morphologies, including fiber, fragments, films, um, and they must be considered a solid material to in fact meet the regulatory definition. Additionally, they, can, they must be synthetic, and they cannot be naturally occurring. This uh, particular characterization of a microplastic is important when we think about some of these um, bioplastics, essentially as they're called, and I'm thinking particularly of chitazan. So chitazan is the deacetylation of chit chitazan, which is shrimp shells. And that's a pretty popular uh, biopolymer material. It's even used in water and wastewater treatment and point of use devices. So the, these uh, chitazan materials um, are in fact now considered a microplastic under the regulatory definition in California. Additionally, there's um, so many sources of microplastic in the environment and into the human body, uh, particularly our exposure routes uh, are through tap water, bottled water has much higher concentrations than tap water typically, um, seafood, and I say select crops because some studies have found nanoplastics, for example, in agricultural crops. Um, this is of particular importance um, when we look at how they're characterized. So I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Synthetic textiles are in fact one of the predominant sources of microplastics into the environment. And sometimes that's because our wastewater treatment plants are in fact not even removing them um, to a, a certain degree or because we're then land applying what results. Um, and if we look at, for example, the ocean, there's massive sources of microplastics uh, from the fishing industry. Those typically occur as those macro meso sized plastics that then break down over time. From a treatment plant perspective, as we consume microplastics through various sources and as we wash our clothes, they're releasing microplastics into our wastewater treatment facilities. These wastewater treatment facilities can remove um, at times relatively low amounts of microplastics. This depends upon if they use primary, secondary, or tertiary treatment uh, stages, essentially. And those, um, as those treatment stages increase, the removal rates increase as well. What begins to happen, though, is the microplastics shift from the liquid stream of the treatment process into the solid stream of the treatment process. And the solid stream is typically used to create what we call biosolids to then land apply. And these land applied biosolids have potentially massive amounts of microplastics in them as a result. This creates the propensity for them to then be uh, um, you know, distributed in the air and occur in agricultural runoff. And this runoff um, then is just another source of microplastics into our environment. I mentioned methods um, previously, and this is of importance for microplastics because of what has what a lot of our historical data on microplastics may in fact be using methods that are not considered robust. Um, I work with Dr. Rolf Halden at Arizona State University, and we have determined uh, certain papers are considered vulnerable in their methods for microplastic identification. And if we look at um, the occurrence of these studies throughout time, we don't really see that as time progresses, the number of studies that are considered vulnerable decreases, which is very concerning. Some of the challenges with these methods of about 134 papers um, that were in this meta-analysis, one of the categories that is within the, the error percentage there is actually a density separation. So plastics, of course, 
occur in a size range or a various, uh, various range of densities, everything from 0.85 grams per cubic centimeter to uh, 2.3 grams per cubic centimeter. And what you see in early microplastic literature is a lot of these very uh, low density plastic types being quantified the most, which is a curious thing when considering they're not always the most commonly produced plastic types. So for example, here in this uh, figure, if you look at the red lines, those, those denote where um, actual densities were utilized in literature. And if we kind of move across from here at 1.14, all of these materials beneath that red line are not quantified. And that's because the density separation process is typically used to separate out sediment and the supernatant of that, what floats to the top is removed and quantified. And this is, this is a really big challenge for a massive amount of papers that are published today. So these here, these red lines all just denote uh, the occurrence of densities that uh, really didn't quantify a lot of the um, percentage of plastics that are out there. I did a study um, last year that found a PTFE in wastewater influent and effluent. And that was because we didn't use uh, density separation for our, our um, analysis there. And that was one of the first studies to actually find PTFE in wastewater effluent. Interestingly enough, um, PTFE is also a PFAS plastic. Um, so it's the co-occurrence essentially of plastic, microplastics and PFAS creating a higher propensity for the toxicity of those particle types. So we want to definitely begin to, um, to reconsider some of our methods on density separation to ensure that we're capturing all of the materials. If you look on the right side here, the uh, particle identification methods are pretty interesting in literature as well. And that's because there were a great deal of papers published that use microscopes only. And um, we determined those studies have no form of uh, material identification if they only use a microscope. It's considered a visual identification. And as you can imagine, as these particles get smaller and smaller, even with the ability to um, use a microscope, our percentage for error increases in determining that they are in fact a microplastic. And there were actually subsets of studies that did confirm that using a microscope only created a much higher uh, percentage of error up to 75 or so percent in some studies than um, actually using material identification such as microramen and micro FTIR. Of the 134 papers that were analyzed here, 30% of them used microscopes only. And that's really concerning um, for that 2010 to 2017 uh, subset because um, we didn't see that microscopes were being kind of phased out as methods improved. It seemed um, in that data subset that there were still a great deal of studies using microscopes only. Another interesting subset of uh, the findings of this analysis was that there's, there's this other category here. And it's kind of a curious category um, because some of these studies that were placed within the other uh, category there actually used really um, interesting methods such as using um, a lighter to melt a material. And if it melted, then it was considered plastic. So, I think this, this figure here really helps us support that we have to be highly critical of these studies that were published during this time frame, um, And we have to be critical of the methods being used. Moving forward, ideally, we will rely more upon ASTMs and various types of method standardizations to avoid essentially data that creates this uh, vulnerability in our occurrence uh, data for microplastics. Another big question that I had when analyzing this data was, um, are nanoplastics considered? And 
Of the 134 papers, 93 provided the smallest size range analyzed. Um, and as you can see here, a majority of those papers were actually between around 100, and one mic 100 micrometers and one micron. And that, um, while these studies are um, using microscopy, they may actually incidentally tend toward the larger size ranges of microplastics. When we look at wastewater effluent, for example, and drinking water effluent, we see a massive amount of microplastics that are less than 100 micrometers. Um, and that is supported in literature. Some studies find more than 90% of the microplastics occurring in effluent are smaller than 100 micrometers. So what this, is, what this data is telling us is that the vast majority of microplastics may not be getting quantified um, during this time period. Moreover, if we look at these various um, studies on potential toxicity and the ways in which microplastics can move within the human body, then we see that um, a lot of what could be considered more toxic happens at the, the lower size ranges here. So there, was, uh, there were studies on deposition in the liver, kidney, and gut. Of course, um, if you follow microplastics, you've, <laughs> that uh, study is heavily debated. But it, that was in the, the smaller size ranges, closer to 10 uh, micrometers, for example. So altogether, we really want to shift our attention to the smallest microplastics that are potentially much more toxic. And to do so, we must improve our methods. If we look at these methods um, analyzed here, um, I've actually organized them by the quality of data that's produced. And looking here, there are certain studies that use no processing, no processing at all. And that's because they don't use density separation or oxidation. While density separation is very, very tricky, and it does have that likelihood for uh, omitting certain material types, oxidation is perhaps one of the most important steps in your microplastic analysis. And that's because that removes all of the organic matter, of course. And then whenever you um, actually identify your microplastics, if they've been sorted, using certain um, automated or semi-automated techniques, they can quantify your microplastics much more readily without all of that kind of organic matter um, distorting the view of these uh, technologies. And thinking about the toxicity of microplastics, when we talk about them, I kind of like to think of it in three major categories. And that's the physical or inherent particle toxicity, which like I just mentioned, uh, that relies heavily upon the size range of the plastic. Um, and that relies upon its ability to move within the human body. Um, this, is act this actually can be considered similarly to asbestos because asbestos is toxic because of the shape and the size of the particle and how it acts as a human body or as <laughs> how it acts as a foreign body in the human body. Um, so microplastics are kind of like that um, in some ways, if you look at toxicity from that essentially vector. Um, in other ways, microplastics can or may be toxic because of the various contaminants that they absorb in the environment and then release. So examples here include um, triclosan, uh, DDT, pharmaceuticals, and of course, PFAS. Remember though, um, some of these plastic types are actually PFAS plastics, like PTFE and PVF. So this physical or inherent toxicity of a particle is really the driver of a lot of toxicity studies today. However, the release contaminants um, can't kind of be um, dismissed. Additionally, there's this variety of biological communities that can grow on microplastics. And that's because there are some really interesting studies that find that there are many, many more biological communities and types growing on plastics than you'll find in the ambient environment, essentially. And that's because they have, they prefer these substrates. And microplastics in particular, as they degrade and are weathered more in the environment, they create these mini um, kind of crevices and cracks 
that allow for part of that allow for um, biological communities to essentially kind of go into those cracks and even sometimes escape things like disinfection in wastewater and drinking water treatment. I know I mentioned uh, the microplastics PFAS connection a couple of times, and this is really an emerging issue. I think about it similarly to the co-occurrence of triclosan and triclocarbon in the environment, um, where microplastics and PFAS, they do not always co-occur, but sometimes they do. Um, and that's for four different reasons here. Uh, first is because PFAS can leach from some types of plastics. That's because they're fluoridated, after they're produced, it is considered a method of hardening plastics. Um, also, PFAS absorbs onto microplastics. There was a recent study, I believe it was just last year, that found it absorbs onto microplastics at higher concentrations in the environment than in laboratory settings. That's probably because we don't approximate what microplastics really look like in the environment enough in a laboratory setting today. We don't really capture how much um, how much the particle has degraded and how many crevices it has. Those kinds of things. How many? How much the uh, existing additives have perhaps already leached out? Um, the third vector for ways in which microplastics and PFAS can co-occur is, uh, for example, PTFE um, and PVF. So those are actual PFAS plastic types. Then the fourth but really not the least likely is uh, stain resistant and water resistant coatings that are applied on synthetic fabrics. And those are essentially PFAS coated or PFAS laden microfibers. When we look at the regulatory timeline for microplastics and we try to kind of figure out like crystal ball it, if you will, and figure out where this is going. Um, I like to kind of look backwards a bit and back uh, before the Microbead Free Waters Act was passed, about 15 states had passed microbead bans, and that uh, includes California. There, um, so all of these microbead free, all of these microbead bans were passed, and that kind of led to the federal government acting and banning them from cosmetics. Fast forward a bit. And uh, back in 2018, California kind of took a step forward um, and began and passed State Bill 1422 and 1263. And today I would consider these two bills are leading not just the United States in microplastics regulations, but also the world. Um, and I consider California the regulatory frontline for microplastics. Um, so um, also nationally in 2018, the Save Our Seas 2.0 microplastic reduction amendment was passed. However, that, um, the impacts of that for the water and wastewater field might not, might not be as, um, as big as uh, some of the work with uh, California. If we look at just last year, uh, there was a microplastics monitoring and science strategy published for Chesapeake Bay. Canada is doing a lot of work with plastics in general. They uh, consider plastics to be a toxic substance now. And here in the United States, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act was proposed. This would require microfiber filters on washing machines, which is actually one very big step toward reducing microplastics and wastewater influent. Um, however, this is simply proposed at this time. It hasn't been passed. This year in California will be the start of drinking water and environmental monitoring for microplastics. And um, a standardized method was approved for microplastics in drinking water. There will be one approved for ocean water as well. Um, and it was mentioned in related to State Bill 1263 that the tertiary wastewater treatment plants will even be uh, encouraged to recycle their wastewater. Moving forward, California has stated that, um, or at least the Ocean Protection Council in California has stated that they would like to add microplastics monitoring on wastewater in PDES permits and uh, develop reduction strategies. In terms of how microplastics could be regulated, 
in drinking water, wastewater, and biosolids, we kind of have to go back to the toxicity. And we can't create great toxicity data without great occurrence data sometimes. Um, and part of the challenge there is that there's a essentially a fruit basket, as it's been called, of different plastic types. And then you have a massive, massive range of different sizes. Couple that with the fact that you have uh, varied material surfaces based on if they're in the environment or if they are uh, just what's considered a primary microplastic or simply manufactured in that state. Um, so we have a lot of different things that are kind of making the uh, determination of toxicity much more challenging. However, the state of California is really pushing forward and trying to, um, to move a lot of our research forward that can benefit not just that state, but the rest of us in the United States. Um, so in terms of a non-regulatory screening level, the state of California's water uh, board did actually release 160 nanograms per liter as a screening level there. I think that it is perhaps very intentional that that screening level is not by particle count um, because it, once again, it's difficult to kind of um, to go from particle counts to concentrations. Um, also, when we look at the orders of magnitude today that are not detected at all in the environment, that creates an additional level of uncertainty. If a particle count is, is actually set as a limit and then we are able to quantify nanoplastics, it's very, very likely that that screening level will be exceeded because of the way in which, um, you know, particle breakdown can create a thousand nanoplastics out of one microplastic practically. So, um, and the concentrations of microplastics in drinking water, there's more concern related to uh, surface water sources than groundwater sources. And uh, just recently here in the last year, the, some of the methods were approved and it's really great that those include uh, Raman and infrared spectroscopy specifically they do not include uh, microscopy. So we're getting there on the methods challenge. Um, in terms of wastewater, uh, microplastics regulations could look a little, you know, of course, very different from how they would in uh, drinking water. There are proposed thresholds or tiers that are happening now where some of the lower concentrations will require monitoring of ambient waters um, and as those concentrations increase, um, you'll want to quantify the sources such as discharge monitoring for NPDES permits and uh, TMDL listing for a given water body. And last but not least, uh, mandated source control action. So those are specifically mitigation strategies for wastewater. When we look at these various thresholds, um, there's a food dilution model and a tissue translocation model. For the food dilution model, you do see much lower concentrations of microplastics that would require source control, for example. Um, 94 particles per liter is relatively low. Add in the potential for nanoplastic detection here in the next five years, and um, it's pretty likely that there will be wastewater treatment plants uh, that are required to do source control. When we look at biosolids, there are really four primary drivers for the regulations uh, that could happen there. However, no states and at this time, no countries are really moving forward with uh, any regulations in, on uh, microplastics and biosolids. Um, one of the primary issues is the fact that um, there's the potential for the agricultural crop uptake. However, that would happen at that nanoplastic size range. And we can't yet quantify nanoplastics even to fully determine um, what a threshold could look like or the percentage of those that are uptaken. That's really a massive um, area that is unknown. It's a really big research gap for us. Also looking at the fact that about 99% of microplastics and wastewater treatment facilities are unaccounted for. And those are very likely to occur within the sludge or the biosolids. 
Um, however, we can't quantify them today. And it's very, very difficult to quantify microplastics and biosolids due to the massive amount of organic matter that would need to be oxidated. When we look at steps forward um, on the challenges that microplastics present for us related to drinking water, wastewater, um, one of the big steps, of course, and this is similar along the PFAS track, is uh, to look at mitigation strategies for uh, sources, so source control. And one of the big approaches there that I would say has the highest potential for impact would be establishing washer, washing machine and dryer filter regulations, preventing the massive release of microfibers that occurs there into our wastewater and into our air. Um, the are two really big steps, I think. Um, Additionally, for utilities, con conducting a source tracing analysis, if there are really high amounts of microplastics coming into either the source water or the uh, wastewater treatment facility, that's very important. I had the opportunity to work with the utility um, that was finding massive amounts of microplastics and their influence suddenly. It was causing issues along their treatment process and they were releasing them into the environment. It, to the point where it was visible. Um, and con by conducting source tracing, we were able to find the industry that was releasing those and to actually stop that release. Um, so that had massive implications just through source control. So I would say that's one of the, the biggest hopes is that if um, utilities do encounter massive amounts of microplastics, that source control is relatively effective um, installing various methods for capturing plastics before they become microplastics is also important. Um, and in that way, all of the research on plastic waste has to work together, um, all the researchers. Um, enacting single-use plastic bans and considering uh, things that we typically wouldn't think about, like the atmospheric deposition of microplastics into drinking water reservoirs. Uh, should be considered when we're designing these as engineers. If we also look inside of the fence, there's a few different places that we can look to reduce microplastics, and that includes the recycle streams. I conducted a study where we quantified the microplastics uh, in the centrate return. So in, along the solid stream process, as you dewater the solids, you create a centrate. And a lot of the time, that's actually sent back to the head of the plant. However, if you look at how microplastics are moving along the treatment process, you'll see they, they are really sent to that solid stream process. And as, they're, as the centrate process occurs, or the centrifuge process occurs, a lot of those microplastics are actually end, end up being sent back to the head of the plant and broken down more and more as they more or less recycle through the entire treatment process. Um, so evaluating recycle streams is a really big thing there. Um, covering unit processes that could be open to the atmosphere for drinking water specifically. Um, if you see any visibly degraded hardware, including painted surfaces, and that goes for um, in the um, that goes for like vessels and boats and things as well. If you see anything that has paint that's peeling off, those are it's probably releasing microplastics. And uh, preventing the increased breakdown of microplastics by unit processes and evaluating mitigation strategies. When we think about mitigation strategies um, today, we are very limited by the research that's available to us and the potential method vulnerability in that research. Um, if you look at these different treatment stages, of course, your removal is increasing uh, from primary to secondary to tertiary. However, there are certain treatment processes that may be further breaking down microplastics. An example here is ozonation and sand filtration. One study that I conducted with sand filters determined that microplastics were sometimes being potentially um, stored in those sand filters and then being released in kind of surges. So I think we have to reconsider our treatment processes today to think a little differently about these very small particulate microplastics that can be accumulating 
or being broken down along the treatment process. So with that, I focus here on the minimum removal rates. Um, the maximum removal rates, we're, I think we need to go back to uh, some of our methods, verify that those methods are robust and that, and also look at the size ranges in which these are analyzing. For example, if they only analyze 100 micrometers and above, then we're missing a, a massive amount of microplastics there. So with that, um, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thanks, Gail, for a great presentation. Um, I will remind our audience that you can type in your questions to the Zoom Q&A, and I will be reading um, popularly voted questions first, and then as they come in. And I don't see right now. So I did think of a couple, so I'll ask one. Um, what do you think needs to be done to um, better standardize the methods? Um, well, what's happening with California right now is they're conducting a lot of research on methods and it's beginning to kind of shed a light, if you will, on what can create a lot of error and what can create more robust uh, results. So I would say that once these SOPs are available, that if we as researchers can follow such standardized methods with um, meta-analyses and um, many studies behind those methods, then I think that we can begin to increase our accuracy and precision there, uh, robustness as it's determined. So the primary thing here is to find, for us to establish a method and as a community of researchers really stick to that method. And um, I think that helps us more or less compare apples to apples, as it said, um, because the different methods do have different results. Um, so in the Q&A, we have a couple of questions now. Are there any fate and transport models out there for microplastics or nanoplastics? I believe there are. Um, I think there was just a paper published in the last couple of years on a fate and transport model. There definitely are some for certain um, certain water bodies. So I would, yeah, they, they are available online. Um, so can we gather the microplastics, but then what? Are there some ways we can ultimately get completely rid of the plastics in the environment um, in, in an environmentally durable way? Um, you know, I think that that is a really tough question because a lot of the microplastics at least end up in ocean sediment. And I think it's, that's very difficult uh, perhaps to remove microplastics from there. Um, so I would say that it depends on where they do end up. And our best bet is really to capture them before as, as they occur as macro mesoplastics and before they become microplastics. Uh, let's see here. You mentioned that filters on the washing machines and dryers could help significantly. However, what happens when these filters are full or are uh, in need of changing or replacement? How do you handle keeping those microplastics stored within the filters themselves and not leaching out? Did you say, how do you keep the microplastics stored where? Yeah, um, how do you keep the microplastics stored within the filters and not allowing them to leach out from the washing machine dryer filters after the filters are full or need to be replaced? Um, well, the filters would require to be cleaned over time or replaced over time. Um, 
I believe they simply use like an ex a size exclusion mesh type of thing, like similarly to what you'd find with some types of filters and wastewater treatment plants and water treatment plants, just a size exclusion mesh. The issue is actually not necessarily if they don't capture all of them. The issue is then once that filter has kind of reached the end of its useful life, where if we have to discard them, um, and then we're just sending more microplastics to landfills. So it's the, the um, challenge here that we're dealing with is that we essentially have no destructive technologies right now that are reliable. Next question is, what role does industry play in the um, collaboration communication surrounding methods? Uh, reducing single-use plastics would be beneficial, as you mentioned, but um, that would be quite a shift from a business perspective. Are there any business industries that produce plastic that are considering this in a meaningful way? I would say um, the textile industry is very much concerned in working on advancing materials research. Um, where microfibers are occurring in, va in vast amounts in wastewater influent, for example, um, I think that has the possibility of really changing um, the challenge today. So the, I know the textile industry is working a great deal on this. I believe the plastic industry has primarily focused on myrtles, which are the, um, the, the manufactured primary microplastics. Um, and perhaps they've, they've created these various types of programs that are aimed at not releasing those into storm drains. However, those programs haven't been successful at all facilities. So I would say some industries are making great advancements and some are uh, perhaps in need of the of advancement today. Would it be environmentally preferable from a microplastics perspective, if wastewater biosolids were incinerated or otherwise converted to a burnable fuel? That's kind of where research is leading today, um, where biosolids may end up becoming, um, it may, there may no longer be beneficial reuse of biosolids. We may end up destroying them, um, and that's due to PFAS and microplastics. Um, so that does look like what uh, a lot of utilities are considering today. It's really sad from an environmental perspective in some ways because of the, uh, the way that we're really reducing waste by use, having beneficial reuse, but that, um, that is a, a big research area. Have you ever looked at landfill leachate contributions to wastewater treatment plants? Um, you know, that's actually a really great question. I know from a PFAS perspective, those are analyzed. Um, however, I don't believe they have been analyzed from a um, microplastics perspective. I think the thought paradigm toward landfill leachates has kind of shifted for wastewater treatment plants where they're not really wanting to accept them anymore because they have so much PFAS and they probably have a ton of microplastics as well, or they do. Um, there is research on landfill uh, leachate in the sense of what is leaching beneath landfills into our groundwater uh, for microplastics and those are higher. Um, so it's, that's a great thought to look into that more. I'm sorry, I was muted. We still have plenty of time for questions, so feel free to keep typing those in. Um, I got one over in the chat that is, are regulatory bodies outside of California thinking more about the need to regulate microplastics? Are some activity, are some actively overlooking, overlooking or questioning the importance? I think that without reliable or not without reliable toxicity, but I think there are great, great needs for more 
data on toxicity of microplastics, and that's by varied plastic type, size, et cetera. Um, and that really follows a lot of these very stringent QAQC approaches that are needed to create a regulation based on that. Um, so I would say California is helping push the toxicity research to getting to the point where it can be used to create regulations, but other states are, are of course more or less, I believe, following what's happening in California. I don't see any other states preparing to do regulations themselves, uh, but you know that's, um, that's very much on a state-by-state -state, uh, basis, and it, it, we could be perhaps surprised here in the next few years, I think. Are you aware of any policies besides single use plastic bans that would stop plastics at the source, essentially phasing out society's use of plastic in fibers, home goods, packaging, et cetera? Um, I'm not, I am actually not aware of many great approaches to reducing plastics beyond single use and beyond more sustainable alternatives. Um, I think a lot of our plastics that we use today are in very unseen ways. Like we don't view our clothing as plastic, even though it typically is. We don't view our like rugs as plastic, but they typically are. Um, nails, you know, when people get acrylic nails and they're ground down, they don't view those as plastics either. So I think that the only way that we can really begin to truly reduce our use of plastics is by beginning to identify where and what they are, which is almost everything around us sometimes. Um, so that's kind of that fundamental thought process shift that we need to be able to really reduce our exposure and the microplastics that can result. Do you know what the byproducts are of destruction incineration of microplastics and if those potentially would have even more damaging um, effects in the long run? So the incineration in particular, there are studies um, on incineration of microplastics. They do find microplastics still in the ash at the bottom of the incinerator which uh, leads us to believe they're not truly dis like disrupted in that process. There isn't any research on if they're released into the environment through the um, air stacks. So I think there's just a lot unknown on a lot of these technologies. Whatever we end up using for PFAS destruction though, um, especially using these like extremely high temperatures like for pyrolysis of uh, PFAS, I think those, sh those should destroy plastics as well. But that even with PFAS uh, being a very regulated toxic or becoming a very regulated um, compound today, that research is still ongoing. Um, so I think we have some, you know, some several years probably before we're able to uh, use technologies that actually destroy microplastics. My N95 is polypropylene. Am I breathing plastics? There was actually a study on that. Um, so we are breathing in microplastics through different types of masks. I can't speak specifically to N95s having higher um, concentrations of microplastics that we breathe in. Um, and sometimes in certain cases, if you think about the level of microplastics already in indoor air, for example, these masks can perhaps even reduce your exposure. I think that's probably a lot less likely, but yes, masks release microplastics that we inhale. Um, and there, there are really great studies out there. I would I would check some of those out. Do you see, do you foresee a future where we use less plastics in our everyday life or a new generation of sustainable plastics? I think 
what I foresee is what can be a new generation of sustainable plastics. Um, but in certain parts of the world, that's already becoming slowed down. And that's because of what we consider regrettable substitutes that happens often. It's what's happening with like BPA where it's replaced with BPS or PFAS being replaced with various uh, other like next generation PFAS compounds. Um, so regulators are being careful, at least in Europe, toward how we replace plastics with bioplastics. Some of these bioplastics can actually be the future, but others are perhaps not necessarily less toxic or less degradable or more degradable, I'm sorry, than typical plastics that we use that are fossil fuel based. Um, so the, the, what I'm getting at here is we have to be very careful as a society what materials we select to substitute um, some of these petroleum based plastics. And I, I really, um, if you follow what's happening in Europe, they're essentially kind of putting a, a you know, strong breaks on some of those replacement processes because of concerns for toxicity. As a follow-up, what would be the biggest challenges to implement sustainable plastics? Um, I would say what, if you look at why Europe is slowing things down a lot, I would say it's because of uh, our human er error, more or less. Um, people are much more likely to see a sustainable plastic and actually throw it on the ground, for example, and litter that, that because they believe it will degrade. So that's a huge issue. Um, it's also a huge issue when, if we don't have ASTMs available for what these sustainable plastics are, then we end up using essentially just another version of things that we've used before, more or less maybe. Um, so I would say a lot of it's like our human error um, and how those, those um, sustainable materials could perhaps be treated differently because we think of them differently than plastics. Um, that was my, oh, also another question I was thinking of, um, how do uh, biodegradable plastics uh, impact the microplastic, nanoplastic uh, issues there? So I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that. Um, the biodegradable plastics, what some research is indicating is they don't necessarily uh, indicate less toxicity when they become microplastics and nanoplastics. So we have these materials that we're kind of producing without guilt um, and we're throwing them away similarly, perhaps to the way that we would throw away traditional plastics um, and they're still breaking down and becoming toxic. I think about, actually, I think about biodegradable glitter as a good example, <laughs> because I think that we may be, we may more readily use these different glitters um, because we are kind of, this kind of a guilt-free thing, but if they aren't degrading in wastewater treatment plants and they still end up in our waterways, then it isn't, a, you know, a good alternative. It's still an issue. Uh, let's see, an additional question. Um, they write, you may have said it, but is there any results from the health effects of nanoplastics in animal organs, including humans? This seems like a key question that would raise awareness for nanoplastics and microplastics and spur more research funding. So in terms of um nanoplastics, I don't know that there's a lot of research on those because they are essentially, we can't quantify them today. We can't verify that a particle is a nanoplastic. Um, there is research on um, small microplastics in the human body and in various like mammals, for example. There was um, actually the state of California put together this um, or 
a researcher with the state of California and the Southern California Coastal Water Research Group there, um, put together a really great um, model, I believe. It's like an online database and you can then filter by um, different, you know, like plastic types, for example, to look at toxicity. So I would say um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of data out there. The QAQC of the data is what's questionable. Um, and then if you look on certain um, databases like that, then you can get some really great answers. So I haven't received any more questions. So thank you, Kayla, again, for presenting an excellent presentation and good discussion. And so what final thoughts would you like to leave us with? Um, really that we have to, we can't simply solve this by changing the material. I think that that's something that we, we would all love to see as a society that we wouldn't have to change our daily use patterns to actually, you know, stop the release of microplastics. But I, I don't think that um, simply changing the material is going to be the long-term solution here. I think that we have to reconsider the way that a lot of the things that we have built in our society um, and the things that we use daily are, we just have to rethink uh, our approach altogether. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you.